Welcome, everybody. It is Wednesday, September 9th, and this is the General Housing and Military Affairs Committee. We are picking up uh, work on S-237, uh, which we've been working on now for, for several weeks. And today, uh, I wanted to start off the day with uh, David Hall, who is going to come in. I may ask them to make some some changes to H-739 that... Um, we would, I would like us to consider to be inserting into this bill um, uh, as because this, as the end of the biennium, we're into um, trying to take bills that have that are germane to housing and, and make sort of an omnibus bill. And this bill has been um, talked about a lot in this committee. And, and I just asked them to make some changes that were reflective of, of things that have happened since March. Um, and also some realities about what we think we can get across the line. Um, also here is Ellen Sajowski. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I butchered your name, Ellen, again. Um, the, um, who has a, a strike call amendment to 237 based on the recommendations or the draft recommendations really that I made yesterday um, based on what I um, picked from, from different resources. So also with us today are uh, Representative Amy Sheldon and Representative Kari Dolan. Uh, Representative Sheldon is the chair of the Fish and Wildlife and Natural Resources Committee. I'm sorry if I butchered your committee's name. And, um, and Kari is also on that committee and they have spent quite a bit of their time working on um, Act 250 over the biennium. And I think that they can, um, I asked them to come in to help with this bill um, if there was anything that that they can help with. Um, they did a walkthrough yesterday. So with that, I'd just like to um, uh, open up the microphone to David Hall, because um, I'd like to get through um, just this discussion of 739 um, and then put it aside so we can focus on 237. So David, I asked you to do some work on 739. I was wondering if you could just, um, have you been made a co-host yet? I, I don't know. All right. Looks like yes. Okay, thank you. So if you can just, um, you, you took us through the bill last week. You reminded us quite a, of what a bit, quite a bit was in the bill. Um, so if you could just, um, you know, review for the committee what I asked you to pr um, present today, that would be great. Sure. So David Hall, Legislative Council, I hope what you have on your screen is a draft 4.1 of H739. Yes. This is an act relating to improving rental housing health and safety. Um, we've talked about this bill a fair amount. Again, uh, last week, as the chair indicated, uh, section one, unchanged since you last saw it. And remember that this vests the authority with the Department of Public Safety and specifically Division of Fire Safety to conduct uh, basically the oversight and enforcement of rental housing health and safety laws. Right now that's a bifurcated or it's shared between the departments of health and local health officials. And this would sort of shift the state side from health to public safety. And then the local side would continue as it currently is. Um, again, there's no changes here. So um, if you have questions on this section, please let me know. Um, as I scroll, otherwise I'm gonna keep moving. Anyone? Um, section two here, this is the rental housing registry language. This is the statutory authorization and directive to the Department of Housing Community Development in coordination with Fire Safety Health 911 Board and Taxes uh, to create and maintain a registry of the rental housing in the state. And then three is the requirement to register. Um, I have modified this, as you see here in A, uh, for a couple of reasons. One, to eliminate the fee. And two, the landlord certificate scheme that was going to pass this year is not going to happen, it looks like. And uh, right now, the statute itself uh, in still in Title 32, governing landlord certificates is not as comprehensive as the duty to register that's being imposed in this act. It doesn't apply 
across the board that landlords have to provide certificates. Um, and therefore the language that was left over uh, was not gonna work in my view. Um, the way I changed it is to peg the registration date to the same date that uh, when a landlord does have to file with Department of Taxes it's by January 31st. So picking up on that from Title 32 and eliminating the fee language, we have what you see in A. So except as provided in those specific cases relating to mobile homes, or mobile home lots, on or before January 31st of each year, an owner of rental housing shall register each rental unit with the HCD. And this, they, 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 do they already do this or is this part of what they report to tax? Right now, they do not register with DHCD. This would be the duty to sign up with DHCD for the registry itself. So okay. right now, there are different requirements for landlords to file with tax depending on uh, the type of property. Whether they have to have more than one unit, and, um, and they're supposed to register at that point. It's the Compliance is not 100%. So. Um, this really decouples the DHCD registration process from the Department of Tax process, which my understanding is in flux relative to what was being proposed when we began this year. Okay, Representative Hango, do you have a question on the content or, um, or <clears throat> uh, on the concept? I don't know the answer to that question. My question is, did David say that there will be no $35 registration fee for a rental housing registry. In this, in, this, in this proposal, yes. So then I wonder how those new positions that we talked about would be funded. So let's just keep that in mind as we go along. Thank you. Yep. All right, so um, B12 and three, are the same substantively. They don't have any reference to registration fees, obviously, but um, otherwise it's the same. The penalty in C is the same. Um, section four and five uh, are session law authorizations for the positions. Um, within DPS and with D, within DHCD. Um, at this point, it's just an authorization. Um, there's no appropriation. There's no fee. Um, there's no duty. And my understanding from the testimony previously is right now they can't add these positions. I mean, they can't fill these positions because of the hiring freeze and because of the inability to train these folks. Um, so, you know, essentially what you would have here in sections four and five is the authority to create these positions and, um, you know, whether and how they are funded and onboarded is going to be an open question. Okay, um, section six is unchanged. These are conforming changes in Title 18 uh, concerning basically the uh, duties of local health officials in the Department of Health, which are uh, no longer applicable. Section seven is the transition provisions. And remember that this basically lays out how the authority migrates from health to public safety and how the rental housing health and safety code that currently exists uh, stays in effect. <clears throat> DPS can adopt it in whole cloth without going through rulemaking or it can adopt its own uh, changes to that code but it has to go through rulemaking. And then, so note the, the timing here in B that upon adoption of rules governing housing, health and safety, 
DPS is becomes the the entity with primary authority over mental housing, health, and safety. DPS local officials have concurrent authority on this subject. And under three, health, local health have the authority <clears throat> with the local uh, with each other for public health hazards and public health risks. So. Before I move on to eight, let me let me pull that all together for you. So the net result is this, the Department of Public Safety would have the legal authority to in statute to adopt, um, excuse me, to basically inspect, enforce uh, the housing health and safety laws Remember that they already have mm, roughly 70% of the issues. This would close out the rest. So they're already doing inspections in some cases, and they're always take, already taking enforcement actions on their portion of it. This would give them the rest and give them the statutory authority to, uh, for instance, if they were in a building and they saw something that was rental housing health and safety related, that currently isn't in their jurisdiction, rather than referring that to the locals or to the Department of Health, they can move forward uh, enforcing the health and safety laws themselves. Um, without the new five positions, probably not gonna be a significant or any expansion of what they do other than those properties where there's some sort of co-occurring issue and, you know, under Section 7, the trigger for them to become nominally the primary authority in state government for enforcing this stuff is when they adopt rules. Um, again, they have the authority here to adopt the health and safety code immediately, or they can go through rulemaking and come up with something else. Section eight is, is the penalties for a vacant property study. I did change the date to March 15th of next year, just because, I mean, it, it had been some, I can't remember if it was December or November of this year, but um, they'll obviously need more time to do that. Um, I wasn't sure what the right date is, whether you would have time to act on it next session, you know, so um, March 15th, kind of a shot in the dark policy choice up to you guys. The last piece is the effective date. Um, for the moment, I've made everything effective on passage. And um, remember that the way this was originally drafted, it was going to be a phased implementation starting in <laughs> July and then October, and then January, and then April for all these different pieces. Um, without any money directly involved here, and because the registration requirement is now pegged in statute to January 31st, um, which so you've got a while before that'll take effect, um, Every, the, all the authority that is created in this act can go ahead and take effect on passage. And then, you know, subsequent implementation is probably going to require additional steps down the road, I guess. So that's what I have so far. Happy to take questions. Okay, we have a question from Representative Triano. <clears throat> So uh, without any funding, uh, David, this bill, uh, if we pass this, it will give, it will render the authority uh, totally from the Department of Health, to the Department of Public Safety, and it will give the authority to hire these positions once funding is found uh, for these positions. Is that accurate? I think that's accurate. Okay. Thank you. And David, does this, and just to reiterate, this allows the, um, this has the enabling language for the registry to be um, developed? Yes. 
and so and committee we've talked um, about the possibility of using CRF funds uh, for this uh, and that is in the budget as it stands right now we'll hear we'll probably hear about that over the next couple of days so there is funding for it as long as it can be done prior to December 31st. Mm. If it cannot be done before the 31st, then obviously this can't happen um, in this way. And it remains, it remains an unfunded, um, it remains unfunded. Representative Hango. Um, yes, thank you. I just want to bring up a point that I brought up last week when we discussed H739, and that is the um, computer system that would run this registry. I don't see anything in this latest iteration of how we would upgrade and or pay for that. Um, so that remains a concern for me. Thank you. Okay, and that's exactly what the funding would be for that if they can, if they can manage the system prior to the end of the year, as long as that remains the deadline for the expenditure of CRF. So also um, then the funding for the personnel, same thing, CRF funds? No, we can't use, oh, we can use CRF in the creation of the registry. We cannot use it for ongoing. So it becomes, um, again, it becomes at the, um, the ability of the department to be able to hire the people. And right now there's a hiring freeze on. So this is just part of the um, process of building that system. And, the, and without the new rental rebate system, um, we received testimony over, over time that the public information that is already available through the rental rebate program can be used in order to build this um, system is not reliant on the new system that they had proposed and thought that they were going to be able to implement earlier this um, session. So actually that testimony was not satisfactory to assure me that we could use that database and that it could be shared across agencies. Um, so I, I'm still referring back to the testimony that we received from the Department of Taxes and the um, Agency of Digital Services that was not um, something they believed could easily happen. So I do remain concerned about the computer system and the information system. And I also remain concerned about the personnel, how they're gonna get these people on board, get them trained and be able to carry out the function of this law. And during this time where we have such a constraint on finances, I really am not seeing the wisdom of passing a law that we can't afford to implement. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And we will have a final discussion about whether we include 739 um, tomorrow during, during our longer session. So, um, but thank you, uh, Representative Zant. I think you might have just covered my two questions. One is the money that's just the, the CRF money that would be dispersed for setting up the computer um, infrastructure. The money merely has to be allocated by December 31st, or does the system actually have to be up and running by December 31st? First question, I think you just hinted at this. Is this bill being considered as a standalone bill or is it gonna get tacked into 237? Um, both of those options are still um, on the table. We've been treating, I've been treating mentally this uh, 237 as being more um, include that, could, that it could include 739 just because of the timing situation. Um, but again, I'm gonna be treat the committee with respect and you know treat the situation with respect and we'll have a vote on whether we include this material into 237 tomorrow or whenever we're ready to wrap up the bill. So it could be a standalone bill, but it, we, I've been working with the, under the impression that it would be um, tagged on to 237. Yes, and, Representative, I'm sorry, go ahead, Randall. Yeah, did, did you say that the computer system had to be stood up by December 31st or just the money allocated? Oh, um, I think that that's, David, do you have a clearer answer on that? I would have to say that the expenditures would have to be made by then, but if David has a clearer answer. Uh, the services have to have been incurred by the end of the year. 
you could actually, because the guidance was updated this summer in the FAQs after your adjournment, um, sort of speaking to this point. And so the services have to be incurred, the, everything has to be, the work has to be done within the covered period. There's some leeway as to when you actually pay the bill. Um, it could be after the covered period. The FAQs say parenthetically that they expect that all the bills would be paid within 90 days, but the work itself would have to be completed by December 30th. And there remains apparently an infinitesimal possibility that that deadline would be extended by the feds, but that's, um, that's what our Senate is working on this week. Uh, Representative Hango. So I just wanted to comment not to be totally negative, but our experience with Vermont Health Connect and setting up and standing up that system um, took a long, long time, a lot of money and um, never was really truly successful. So I have my doubts that this is gonna be able to be stood up and functional by December 31st. Okay, thank you. Um, I will um, take the opportunity to say that Vermont Health Connect was very successful for quite a few people. While it did take some time to get stood up, this program is a little bit simpler in its in its thing. And I and again, we'll have further conversation on this um, before we before we vote on it. Um, in fact, we'll be voting on you know doing a doing a vote on getting it into the bill in the first place. So. Um, all right, with that, I think, um, David, thank you for that update and thank you for the for the rewrite um, or for the adjustments. It's not, um, I think one of the reasons this remains a priority um, is it was was encapsulated in testimony received, you know, yet as recently as yesterday from Earhart, which discussed um, very much the same attitude towards having a rental registry as, um, as a lot of us experienced after Tropical Storm Irene, which was if we had a rental registry and we knew where apartments were um, and who to contact, that perhaps we would have had some places to put people um, in a much more local way than, than we have the, the ability to do now. And so um, this is, this is in, in many people's view, an important step forward in order to do that in, in case this happens um, again. The, um, I want to move to S237 now, and um, Ellen, if I could bring you up, and, um, and uh, I guess before we start running through, um, I, 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 want to, I want to bring in um, Representative Dolan and Representative Sheldon again. They did a, they did a um, walkthrough of this yesterday, I believe, and I just, um, but they were not, um, I didn't share the the potential draft that that I shared with our committee with them yesterday, but I wanted to just get a sense if you could get us from your committee's perspective how the um, discussion of this went yesterday before we before we get into kind of a point by point on the um, the draft that's going to be in front of us. Representative Sheldon, do you want to kick us off? Um, I'll give it a go. Um, Welcome. Thank you for having me, Amy Sheldon, Chair of House Natural Resources, Fish and Wildlife. Um, so we did a walkthrough and we heard from um, the, let's see, um, Vermont Planners Association. We had a little reminder of the terms in the bill. And then we also heard from Chris Cochran and um, we, who am I blanking on, Carrie, <laughs> the other witness. Um, Alex Weinhagen, Chris Cochran, and Ellen. We basically, actually, we didn't get very, we just had an hour and a half, or no, we had two hours. We did a walkthrough. There were a lot of questions, people just trying to understand the bill. Um, I know uh, that the issue, some of the issues that you guys have, have concerns with as well came up in our committee around um, linking the density, the requirements for following the water and sewer lines is one that stands out for me. Um, there was concern about um, the flood, flood hazard areas, which is um, something that we've been involved with certainly in the past. 
And um, from there, I'm going to see what Carrie has to offer as what she remembers. Thank you. Uh, Carrie Dolan um, on the House Natural Resources Fish and Wildlife Committee. And I thank you for this opportunity. Yes, I, I think generally we share your support for uh, seeing more affordable housing across Vermont, uh, including the service of our rural communities as well. Uh, we, we also agree with some of the testimony we heard yesterday from the Vermont Planners Association about the potential for unintended consequences that if we aren't specific as to where we would like to see greater infill that we could result in um, the, some of the unintended consequences of sprawl or even heightened public safety concerns related to uh, impacts to our areas that are most vulnerable for flooding. I think we all learned from Tropical Storm Irene how important it is for us to to maintain a, an effort of achieving greater resiliency of our existing and future housing stock. And uh, so these are real uh, long-term effort to ensure that both risk and costs of flood recovery are minimized. And why we, are, um, we share your concerns for uh, wanting to uh, achieve uh, safe housing as well as more affordable housing. Uh, so that went into um, some of the specifics were identified in the Vermont Planners Association testimony where they talk about geographic area of, of applicability. And we support that, that type of clarity to ensure that we are achieving the type of development, increased uh, housing development where we want to see that occur. <clears throat> I, I think specifically we, we saw um, reference to um, some of the, the old language that the state has had used in the past where it refers to floodplain and, and uh, fluvial erosion hazard areas. The, the more accurate terminology as reflected in state statute and in rule is about river corridors. So we'll need to just clean up some of the, the references uh, throughout that, that bill. Um, but, but basically both the, the, the concern about or the interest about clarity with respect to where housing would occur and the definitions of both um, that are already existing in uh, Title 24, uh, such as infill development, what that means when we use them in, in, the, in, this, um, in this, this bill. Um, the, one of the items we had um, in H926 pertaining to river corridors was something that um, was not controversial. It was simply reflecting current practice uh, of how the state implements Criterion 1D of Act 250. And that now it doesn't exist in this bill and it doesn't exist in the Senate bill. So I'd like to see uh, that information come back into this bill. It's, um, and I think it, uh, it refers to what's currently in H926 in Criterion 2 related to river corridor. Um, that river quarter standard or criteria. Um, and then the, um, let's see, I think another uh, interest uh, or concern that uh, came up with, which we actually appreciate, we appreciate the uh, reference on, I'm looking at the Senate bill on page 39 of S237 that was passed, where it references making those communities with updated bylaws a, um, a priority for some incentive, you know, as incentives, a priority for some funding. And, and it does list the state revolving fund for drinking water and uh, wastewater. I do want to bring to your attention that the state has 2017 environmental protection rules and associated criteria 
for priority listing of uh, projects for state revolving fund uh, applications. So that it, I want to flag that because any uh, and already contained in those criteria include public health water quality, which is tied to federal Clean Water Act requirements and affordability, as well as designated center, center and regional benefit priorities. So there, there's some language in there already. Uh, it may be um, any change in priority or criteria would have to go through rulemaking. So I, I want to just bring that to your attention so that um, um, you know you recognize that it will take both time and effort and it may make sense to hear from the agency of natural resources regarding that that portion of it and then the um the final point I, i'd like to make is regards to the tax credit which I, I think we all recognize that is an important tool and we've used it in, in a number of cases but what we have learned, especially with Tropical Storm Irene and our, the vulnerability of Vermont in, from flooding, is that we are really dealing with two types of flood impacts, both inundation, which is the height of water spilling over, as well as the what we call fluvial erosion hazards or erosions, erosion related to flooding. So, uh, some, not all flood proofing is created equal. Some flood proofing makes sense, such as elevating you utilities off um, to give some height away from flood waters. But if a um, some of the flood proofing actually entails increasing erosion hazards on other properties, such as establishing or putting in a berm or putting in some sort of water diversion at the site, you're actually increasing the erosion hazards on other people's property. So we want to make sure that we're not incentivizing the wrong type of flood proofing. So it's, again, something I want to flag that, um, that we should be take care and certainly um, look to the type of flood proofing that where it makes sense to offer a taxpayer um, cover taxpayer um, type of credit or incentive. Okay. Um, thank you. I mean, I'll have further questions in a bit, but we have two questions lined up here. Representative Hango, then Kalaki. Thank you. Um, and this isn't really directed at um, natural resources, fish and wildlife, but um, since this bill was passed out of the Senate, um, there have been so many parts, moving parts of the H-926 Act 250 reform bill that have come and go from this bill. It, it's fairly clear to me that this is a zoning and natural resources type bill. And I know that we're the housing committee and people build homes in various places in Vermont that might need the advice of the Agency of Natural Resources or um, legislation from the Committee of Natural Resources. But this bill, I really feel, is beyond the scope of our committee's jurisdiction. And I'm hearing so many pieces of, well, we need to look at the effect, we need to talk to Agency of Natural Resources, we need to hear from Department of Environmental Con Conservation, excuse me. So um, I guess my concern is we've talked about this from the beginning as an affordable housing build bill, but it's evolved into a zoning bill. We've heard from just about every municipality in the state of Vermont about zoning bylaws. I really feel that this should be in natural resources fish and wildlife committee and i i would like to know how the chair feels about that um just because i know you heard this bill in your committee very briefly but it seems like there are so many pieces that apply to the jurisdiction and the the hard work of your committee amy yeah, thanks for that um, question. Uh, I guess since we're just unpacking it for the really for the first time, um, I'm in the process of figuring all of that out. And there are a lot of areas 
a lot of sections of the bill that are in our areas of um, jurisdiction. I would agree with that. So that's why we're here today to listen in on what you all are doing. I, I, um, I think at the beginning of this, Representative Stevens said you've taken weeks of testimony. I didn't realize that. Um, and uh, so we have, we have some questions and, and Representative Dolan outlined them very well. So we are here to have kind of that conversation and understand where we are with the bill. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that you recognize that this is very important to your committee. And I feel like if you're just looking at it for essentially the first time this week, that it's a real stretch to think that we could put together something meaningful by September 25th. So I, I want us to be really careful about that because since parts of 926 are now gone and gone for good for this session. There are only a few parts remaining. I feel like this is becoming the new H926. And, um, you know, your committee has spent two years dealing with that bill. And this is very important legislation for you. So I, I hope if we do this by September 25th, it's going to be done right with the correct input from the correct committees and agencies. Thank you. Representative Kalaki. Well, uh, first of all, thank you, Representative Dolan and Sheldon for coming to the committee. And, and I love when our committees um, work together like this. Uh, I, um, I have a different perspective than our, my colleague, uh, Representative Hango, but I am wondering in the bill in the Senate, there was a number of 250, Act 250 provisions in it, and then it went out into another bill in the Senate, and then that didn't move forward or something. And do you feel that the bill as it currently stands with, with none of that needs some of that integrated? Or Representative Dolan, did you address the issues you would have from your committee's perspective with, with your comments this morning or earlier today? Well, I guess I'll start by just saying that we didn't, um, this bill actually stood on its own at the beginning and then um, pieces of H926 were added to it and then removed. Okay, um, okay. I think that's important to understand a little of the history of the bill. Um, Thank you. Yeah, and then my understanding is this bill didn't necessarily start with, um, with any Act 250 um, directly. Um, and then as far as my committee having time to have uh, considered that, we, we haven't, done that yet. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. So with that, um, Kari, are you okay where you are? In comments? You're already unmuted. Oh, yes, I am. I'm fine. And I, I, I understand in, in terms of a next step that our committee anticipates putting together a letter for you. And I think that's underway to help help to identify or outline some of the, the comments that we shared with you today. That's great. And then again, if you are here today um, to hear how, how Ellen has you know, provided a strike all that I think incorporates a lot of the um, uh, commentary that's been made by stakeholders. Um, we, there may be answers to some of the questions that you raised. Um, but certainly not all of them. Um, so Ellen, if you're, if you can join us and, um, committee, what I would prefer as we're going through this is to hear the walkthrough of the bill, um, of the chain, especially of the changes that were made, um, based on what I shared with Ellen. And then we can go to questions after that. I just want to make sure that she has the opportunity to get through the bill itself. And um, and then we can ask um, we can ask questions as a follow up. I would appreciate that. Thank you, Ellen. Ellen, the microphone is yours. Thanks. Okay. So uh, yes, uh, based on the testimony you've received, uh, Representative Stevens provided me with some uh, comments and recommended um, um, edits. So I have made some changes to S-237 for you to consider. So first, 
um, the first change is um, on page uh, two. So in section two, the prior draft had that language regarding um, in a residential district that allowed multi-unit dwellings, um, you couldn't pr uh, prohibit four or fewer dwellings based on the character of the area. So my uh, interpretation of the, dis you all had a very long discussion about the character of the area aspect being the important aspect. So my interpretation of that was that it wasn't um, about bylaws, but about how the character of the area test was used. And that um, standard is related to the conditional use um, process. And that, I, that language is actually in another statute. So I took it out of section two and I added it in section three. Um, and so I don't know if you want to skip it for now or if you would like to look at that right now. No, it's just go page by page. That would be great. Okay. So that's why this language is different. We'll get to that in the next section. So then um, I didn't, I don't think we're at the moment, I don't think at the moment you're looking for any changes to the ADU language. Um, so there isn't any changes there yet. Um, but the next change is in the inclusive development language. So starting at the bottom of page five. Um, so the following land development provisions shall apply in every municipality. So first, this is our first language change. No bylaw shall have the effect of prohibiting the creation of residential lots of at least 5,400 square feet or one eighth of an acre within any regulatory district allowing residential uses served by and able to connect to a sewer system operated by a municipality. Um, so we struck, I struck the reference to um, water system here. Uh, then, uh, so shall, no bylaw shall prohibit the creation of residential lots of at least four dwelling units per acre within any regulatory district allowing residential uses served by and able to connect to a water system operated by a municipality or eight dwelling units per acre within a, res a, a regulatory district allowing residential uses served by and able to connect to water and sewer operated by a municipality. So this, uh, the second two prongs are different than what you've been discussing slightly um, by changing the focus to the density of units as opposed to the size of the lots. Which was in response to the, which is in response to the VPA memo. Um, so do you want me to, do you want me to walk through all of it or do you want to, do you want me to stop and see if there are questions? No, I'd like you to continue walking through and then we'll come back okay. with questions. Okay, so the next um, section was including some language um, regarding what this section is not prohibiting. So, so nothing in this subdivision shall be construed to prohibit a minimum lot frontage requirement. So a municipality can use minimum lot frontage of less than or equal to 40 feet. Um, allow subdivision of land for residential lots that once established would result in prohibited land development within the mapped and regulated flood hazard, fluvial erosion or river corridor areas. So nothing in this section shall be construed to allow subdivision for residential lots that once established would result in prohibited land development within mapped and regulated natural resources constraints. Uh, nothing shall be construed to allow water or sewer connection lines, sewer connection to lines or mapped service areas limited by municipal ordinance 
due to system capacity constraints disclosed in a plan, policy, or ordinance. Uh, nothing in this section shall be construed to allow the subdivision of residential lots in municipalities with areas designated pursuant to Chapter 76A of this title, and that's the, the state designation program chapter, um, in the following areas. A quarter mile radius of a designated village center, a half mile radius of a designated downtown, a neighborhood development area, a designated growth center, or a half mile radius of a new town center. Um, D is the language around duplexes that hasn't changed. Um, there's a new piece of language in the parking minimum language. So um, when a bylaw establishes a parking minimum for residential properties, each residential parking space that will be leased separately from residential units shall count as two spaces for purposes of meeting the parking minimum for any proposed development located within areas subject to the inclusive development provisions of this subdivision. Uh, so that language replaced within uh, a half mile of tr a transit stop. And I know there was there were some questions around that um, definition. Okay, uh, and then there is some new language in the municipal constraint report. So the substantial municipal constraint report shall demonstrate that the municipality has documented substantial municipal constraints on its municipal water, municipal sewer, stormwater, transportation, emergency services, schools, or other services that prevent the adoption of bylaws that conform to the requirements of subdivision one of this subsection. Uh, the rest of this language on the municipal constraint reports is the same. So is the incentive section. And then, oh, this should be highlighted in yellow. So this language in section three is the new language about character of the area I was talking about. So 24 VSA 4414 lays out the process for using conditional use review. So I included all the language um, so that you can see. So um, in any district, certain uses may be allowed only by approval with the, of the municipal panel. The general standard shall require that the proposed conditional use shall not result in an undue adverse effect on any of the following. And number two is the character of the area affected as defined by the purpose or purposes of the zoning district within which the project is located and specifically stated policies and standards of the municipal plan. So I added new language down further in that um, conditional use section that says, a multi-unit dwelling project consisting of four or fewer units located within a district allowing multi-unit dwellings may not be denied solely due to an undue adverse impact on the character of the area affected. So I, that was my, um, hopefully that captured the intent of what the committee was discussing previously. And that's, I'm sorry, I'll ask the question later. Sorry. Um, uh, so then section four is the language around uh, deed restrictions can't be added that would um, conflict with the inclusive development provisions. No changes there. Section five is the report from the department on municipal constraints. Um, no changes there. Uh, then section six uh, is a re was a recommendation that you heard, I think, from the VPA on um, title 24 chapter 117 includes this language about challenging bylaws that are discriminatory. So um, it specifically is about when the attorney general or someone can challenge a bylaw or its administration as a violation of 4412. 
So because you're amending that in section two, uh, we wanted to, the, the VPA recommended updating the cross-reference. So this allows for a, um, a lawsuit challenging a bylaw as discriminatory. Um, and it is specific to 4412A1. Um, the, the VPA recommendation did suggest that you could consider adding more to that if you want the new inclusive development um, language to be covered by this. That, that is an option you have, um, but that this allows a bylaw to be challenged in court as discriminatory. So that is a, a policy consideration about whether you want the new inclusive development provisions to have that enforcement mechanism. But just adding the, but as, as I have currently drafted section six, it's just a technical correction. Um, so another thing I did was slightly rearrange this bill um, from as, as it passed the Senate. So I moved up um, this language regarding short-term rentals because it is also amending a section of Title 24, um, but I didn't change the language at all. So this is adding the um, ability for municipalities to regulate short-term rentals separately from uh, long-term rental housing. Uh, and the uh, accompanying section of the study regarding short-term rentals, the chair requested to delete that. And so that's the end of the municipal zoning section. And then here are the, here's the tax credit language. So first is the technical correction in the designation of village center section condensing the language. And then section two is um, the section where first we're adding the neighborhood development area to the tax credit. That hasn't changed. But then we have the language on qualified flood mitigation projects. And so you heard testimony from the commissioner of the DEC on um, uh, having the, the full title of the rule in the, the definition here. So uh, this sentence here in, in subdivision six, we're defining what area will qualify for a qualified flood mitigation project. So um, just so that you can picture it, we're talking about downtowns, village centers, and now neighborhood development areas. So those areas are eligible for the tax credit, but then what kind of projects specifically within them would be eligible? So this is saying any combination of structural and non-structural changes to a building located within an area subject to the flood hazard area and river corridor rule, or within a flood hazard area as mapped by FEMA that eliminates or that it reduces or eliminates flood um, damage to the building or its contents. So I just wanted to flag um, for your consideration, we're using the flood hazard area and river corridor rule and then flood hazard area as mapped by FEMA as two areas within these designated areas that are eligible for the tax credit. Um, you, I, I started to look into, um, I'm not an expert on these areas. I started to look into what the, the size of them was, but you do have an option if you wanted to use a different metric or phrase to define the area within the flood hazard area, where should be eligible for these tax credits. So I hope I said that clearly. <laughs> um, so something to consider if you have interest in that. And then, um, oh, and then there was um, the 
Commissioner of DEC also requested changes to the language in the mobile home park language. So on page 18, um, I used the recommended language that he suggested. So, um, so the department shall assist the town of Brattleboro and Tri Park in implementation of the master plan, including through restructuring of state revolving loans and additional loan to the extent possible to allow for improvements to wastewater and stormwater infrastructure needs. Uh, and then again in two, and to provide similar assistance to the extent possible to similarly situated mobile home parks that also have infrastructure needs. And uh, section 11 doesn't have any changes. Then we have the implementation section in 12, doesn't have any changes. And then the effective date um, is, uh, has been changed to December 1, 2020. So, uh, so those are the changes. Representative Kalaki. Thank you, Ellen for doing all this uh, extraordinary integration with, with the chair. I, I do have three just small points of clarification for myself. On page six, where we have the geographic uh, distribution of a quarter mile, half mile. Um, yeah, right there, thank you. Um, we don't meet we don't need those in three and four. We have one, two, and five. Do we need a geographic radius for three and four? I don't know if, because I don't really, I'm not familiar with all these terms. So that would be maybe a question. Uh, Chair, I don't know who that question's to, but it, would that be, anyway. Um, if, if Chris Cochran, are you available? Yes, um, this is Chris Cochran from the Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, it, it relates to how the designations are made. So okay. there are there are core designations, which are basically the commercial area. And so yes. buffered areas around them would be necessary. And then there's larger geogra geographic areas, which are growth centers um, that are much, much larger areas and neighborhood development areas are larger areas. So this is just recognizing the differences in how these designation programs work. Okay, th thank you. Thanks, thanks a lot. And then page 11. Um, I, you know, I know we're, we're trying to look at this in, inclusive zoning. And I, I wonder if it seems to contradict when you, our new language seems that right there is, I think the intent of this bill. Um, it seems that it contradicts earlier above that when it talks about the character of the area. So if you could scroll up a little bit on page 10 then. There, so uh, under adverse effect and then it has the character of the area. So I'm just, I understand we added for clarity, but Ellen, I wonder if our new thing actually contradicts that number two. It, it does, but so this on page 10 is laying out the current language that is used to evaluate a project. I, oh, I see, I see. Okay. So it clarifies it. Yes. And then on, on page 12, um, I heard you say that we might want to include in our new inclusive development language uh, that's not in here. Did I understand that correctly when you said that? Um, I think you've received some testimony suggesting you could include it in here, um, right. but I just made the technical correction. Okay. Well, I, I, I see that the, ch the chair has an unstable connection, so I don't know if you can hear me, Chair, but it seems to me if this is the intention of this legislation that we should add this uh, inclusive development component into this. So I would... I don't know, Tom, just, can you hear us? Yeah, no, I can hear you. I can okay. just- um, That's my yep. question for us. All right, those are my points, thank you. 
Okay, that's kind of a, that'll be a post-it note for Alan's office there. Um, questions? Kari, did you, um, when it came to this, this reference to the flood hazard areas and river corridors that for the time being was removed from the Millville Home Park um, section, are we, did we refer to those rules um, and areas correctly in your, in your opinion, where we have talked about them? Uh, I'll have to get back to you on that. Um, I know uh, I'm familiar with those projects down in, in Brattleboro. Actually, Ellen, there's just a, there, you just passed the reference just before that to where right there. Yes, I'm, I'm familiar with the projects. I'm also familiar with the tactical basin plan. Some of those, as we know, some of those projects are located in high hazard zones. We refer to those high hazard zones as floodways. And so to the extent to which we can uh, improve the safety of those structures or remove those structures from those floodways, um, we will be making a dramatic improvement in public health and safety. So that, that's my first take when I looked into that section specifically, but I'll, I'll, we'll get back to you in more detail if necessary. All right, and, and Carrie, I'm sorry, you were gonna say something about the, um, the mobile home park section. Is that, I mean, I, I mean, I, that's what you're gonna get back to us on is, is, is the mobile home park section, at least what the, what the thinking is with that. Yes. I mean, because they're, yeah, I mean, they're in a tough spot. They're in a, they're in a really difficult area because obviously they want to be able to plan for relocation. Um, and they're looking for, you know, the guidance to, in order and state support. Yes, it's, it's, um, it's a continued problem statewide where we have inexpensive land is typically highly vulnerable to flooding and where we see time and time again, uh, mobile home parks located in these high hazard areas. So to the extent to which, instead of hardening them with more in public investment only to be damaged in the future, not to mention people living in harm's way, the extent to which we can look to uh, moving people out of these high hazard zones, I think is, is um, the best strategy. It does result in a, a comment that you'll see in our, in our letter when we talk about tax credits. We, I, I do appreciate the thought behind uh, tax credits. And as I described it specifically, we'll want to put some um, guardrails around the type of flood proofing but I also see the value where if you have a, a, an individual actually restoring floodplain function that will only improve the public safety of, of people downstream, we should be thinking about offering those landowners tax credits, but that, that's probably well beyond the scope of this, this, uh, this bill. Okay, thank you, Carrie. Um, um, Earhart, actually, Earhart, I'm going to go to uh, Representative Byrong first and then come to you. Um, thank you. Um, I wanted to shoot back up to page five to the um, lot sizes, please. Um, I'm just, I keep looking at the four dwelling unit per acre and the eight dwelling unit per acre. And well, first of all, actually, in the top, it says uh, connect to a sewer system doesn't say water sewer like the other spots do, like the other subsections. Is that intentional? Yes, it was intentional. Um, okay. one, of the one of the comments that we, we had was that there are gonna be municipalities with a water system and not a sewer system. And, um, and they didn't, they wanted to be relieved of the burden of this particular legislation. And the thing about this, and the thing about the sewer system is that, um, you know, there is, there is um, 
with sewer comes development. I mean, obviously with wastewater comes development. And so um, by removing the, 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 the water only portion of it, it just goes to the sewer system. And again, it does, again, we do have an out in, in the bills also municipalities, I believe are allowed to um, continue to zone locally about where they want their connections to be made, their, their wastewater connections to be made. So I think this tries to get at, and I'm not sure I, I'm not sure we nailed it, but this tries to get at the ideas that were um, prevalent in the letters from Middlebury and from Stowe um, in particular that, that tries to uh, limit the full development options that happen from, from where, you know, the, in the Stowe's case, from the village to the mountain, in Middlebury's case, you know, from, from where it's based to, you know, the college or wherever else they have the sewer going out to. Okay, then I guess my other question, maybe I missed this, um, was the, what's the difference within the content of the four dwelling and the eight dwelling units? The, the language seems to be mirrored, but ex, with the exception of the, the count on the, on the, on the units themselves. Four dwelling units per acre with a water system. Um, yeah, I know, but I'm just losing the four to the eight. Like, why are there the two separate? Because with the eight, with, with sewer, you're allowed more density. Right. The, this, this oh, is. A, oh, I missed the sewer part on the other one. Okay. Okay. That was the gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. So this you. is the adjustment that's, I think it's similar to what people within VPA. I mean, I think the St. Albans, I think Chip from St. Albans was, it was talking about something a little bit different. He was talking about average density within, within the town or the, or the municipality. This is, but this is more along the lines of this. Uh, uh, this was uh, more along the lines of what was in one of the VPA things of just saying rather than a quarter acre lot or an eighth acre lot that it, it is, um, that you, you know, that, that they're strictly, they're not strictly to a per quarter acre here. Mm -hmm. No, that, that, that clears it up for me. Thank you. Um, Earhart. Uh, thank you, um, Representative Stevens. Really appreciate um, the opportunity to uh, offer a comment. Um, so on the mobile home section, um, that was uh, not the one that was just referenced, but the one later on in the bill uh, that talks about restructuring loans, uh, specifically for Tri Park down in Brattleboro. Um, I note that um, the language uh, um, that was originally in the bill around loan forgiveness is not in here. And just to uh, uh, not to elaborate or reiterate uh, too much my testimony from yesterday, but um, we really urge you to include uh, the words loan forgiveness uh, in, it would probably be uh, on line six, um, it could be restructuring uh, or loan forgiveness. Uh, I think uh, the words to the extent uh, feasible um, um, certainly uh, could cover uh, if it turned out not to be uh, not to be feasible but as uh, you may recall I uh, testified yesterday that uh, in looking at the underlying federal statute for the water and sewer funds uh, it does appear that uh, you know over the last few years the program was expanded to allow for um, uh, loan forgiveness or, or very deep subsidies in, in certain cases and certainly I think tripart can make the case that its uh, financial uh, restructuring requirements and its uh, cash flow requirements uh, really call for forgiveness of existing loans in order for um, the three mobile home parks to be uh, you know financially sustainable and, and healthy uh, into the into the future so I would urge you to um, uh, bring that language back uh, back uh, into the bill and um, while I've got the floor, I would just also maybe echo Representative Kalaki's comment on expanding the provisions around the Attorney General's uh, enforcement uh, to include the in inclusive uh, development provisions. That would cer certainly be something that we would, uh, the affordable housing community would support. Thank you. 
And on that issue with the language re with respect to Commissioner Walk's testimony, I believe that um, there are some stakeholders talking with Commissioner Walk. Commissioner Walk had not read the master plan when he testified last week. And I believe that Jen Holler and perhaps Sue Fillion, who did testify, um, will be, um, will be, um, I'm expecting them to have more language over the next day or so, and and we're certainly amenable to to that conversation, getting that getting that that type of language, seeing what comes up after the conversation between stakeholders and the commissioner. Great, thank you. Yep. All right, uh, Representative Sheldon. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Um, and a comment. <clears throat> I guess I'll start with my comment, which is they're both on, it's on pages five and six, the inclusive development sections. I, I'm, I'm really struggling with how, um, if the goal here is to increase density, housing density in our, in our, in a walkable community, I don't understand this requirement to kind of mandate um, residential development along the water and the sewer lines. And so I'm, I don't understand how that's supporting the, the goal of the bill. Um, but maybe, bef and in addition to that, I need to understand, I need someone to help me through the green sections at the top, the bottom of page five and the top of six. And in particular, um, someone already commented on section five, but maybe all of them just to understand what they're actually trying to do. I'm having a hard time following the negatives and the, positives in these statements. So maybe Ellen could help me understand section C at the bottom of five and then the green language. Um, sure, and I don't know if Representative Stevens wants to comment on the intent, um, but the, um, so, Yes, Title 24, especially in this section, does have a lot of um, negatives that you need to keep track of when reading. So nothing in this inclusive development section shall be construed to prohibit a minimum lot frontage requirement less than or equal to 40 feet. Um, so uh, despite, I, I think this, does relate to the um, the density and the minimum lot sizes above. Um, so, despite the fact that those are required, this is saying um, uh, we're not prohibiting minimum lot frontage requirements of less than or equal to forty feet. Um, this subdivision shall not be construed to allow residential lots that would result in prohibited land development within flood hazard, fluvial erosion, or river corridor. So um, we're not attempting to override the flood hazard and river corridor area protections. Um, this section shall not allow for subdivision of residential lots that would result in prohibited land development within mapped and regulated natural resources constraint, natural resource constraints. So we're not um, attempting to override the natural resource protection in these in these areas. Um, nothing in here shall allow uh, water sewer connection lines or mapped service areas limited by municipal ordinance due to system capacity constraints. So um, uh, that are disclosed. And then um, nothing in this section shall allow the subdivision of residential lots in municipalities with designated areas outside of the following designated areas. And I, I do think that is um, a new concept, particularly this last section is a, a new concept that um, wasn't in the bill previously. 
No, this was based on a suggestion again. Um, and what it is meant to do is that it creates an incentive uh, to be designated. Um, so it would it would create this if people were interested in these limitations and they weren't designated then 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 they would um this would create an incentive to get designated so that they had these that that this provision applied to them rather than to stay undesignated that's my that was my understanding from the vpa proposal representative dolan thank you and, and thank you, Ellen, for walking us through that. My follow-up question on page six with that listing is that these are very different designations. Some are very discreet um, and some are can take up a substantial part of a, of a uh, within the a town jurisdiction and uh, which could result in sprawl, which is something we're trying to avoid here. So I, I only want to flag that as something that we should look into to make sure that what we describe here is adequate for the purposes of achieving our goal of infill, more, more affordable housing, and um, without triggering some sprawl or anti-smart growth type of development. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, it's 151 on my computer and I wanna be respectful of our time. We need to be on the floor in nine minutes. Um, and so I think I'm gonna end this conversation here um, and we will pick up tomorrow at 10.30 in the morning. This is a lot to take in and I appreciate people's comments. Uh, Representative Dolan and Sheldon, thank you for coming. If you have um, an interest or it doesn't, um, and it does not conflict with your, any meetings you may have, um, certainly you're welcome to come tomorrow. Um, if you have notes that you would like to share with us, please feel free to email them to me or to the committee assistant today. And this week it's Mike Ferrant, um, and, and we'll be taking it in. Um, so, Thanks everybody for, for listening in on this and we will again, pick this up tomorrow when um, at work through, we have an extra session tomorrow. So we're on at 1030 for this till noon and then we have a half an hour break and then 1230 to two prior to the floor tomorrow. So with that, thank you all and we'll see you then.